see. Okay, we are live on LinkedIn. Today I'm joined by the man of the moment, John Ivanko, who is a customer experience specialist. John, welcome. Let's go over the basics. Give us a quick overview, your background, who you are, and what you're up to. Thanks for having me. Um, background's pretty simple. Uh, been working kind of in tech and around tech for over a decade. And I wound up at a little company called LifeX, ran their marketing for a couple of years, took them from Kickstarter darling. I came on after that, launched their Gen 2 on products. Ended up getting them sold a couple of years ago. Um, so then dedicate all my time to understanding customer journey, customer experience, and what it looks like for the common kind of e-commerce web first experience and how brands are kind of tackling that. So now I work with brands to get their processes in order kind of on the back end and make sure that they're able to provide a great customer experience to everyone. So you've got quite a deep background in SaaS as well as e-commerce as well. So you've been on both sides of the fence. Yeah, big. I prefer the SaaS side. Margins are a little bit better, but uh, mm -hmm. I've been kind of following around and figuring out how people use tools and what percentage of tools people are using to to find success and kind of look towards uh, the, the There's a lot of commonalities between like what customer journey is on both. And you see this coming up a lot in how people experience products and kind of go through what that journey looks like. Yeah. There's a lot of options out there. Like 10 years ago, there were far fewer options. Now there's a lot of options, both for your commodity, commoditized goods and for your, your tech tools and tech stack. Yeah. Yeah, we're gonna touch on some of those comparisons again in a bit, but let's just get straight into it. Let's focus on e-commerce. Um, You've been quite outspoken on a lot of bullshit, uh, challenging me as well, making me upset. <laughs> so what, what is going wrong with e-commerce in 2021 and what needs to change and what is going to have to change if businesses are to, to survive, which you've made quite clear? I, I have a lot of problems with e-commerce, uh, not from the basis that I think it's a bad platform, but that it is completely inefficient. And we've spent way too much time trying to copy each other. Uh, easy. If you're if you're doing ads for e-commerce for the most part, you're copying what other people are doing. Uh, and then you're trying to model your pitch based on what other similar competitors are doing. If you're doing emails, you're subscribing to everyone else's emails and you're looking at what you like. If you're designing a website, you're looking at everyone else in your sector and designing a website that looks really, really similar. We've gotten to this point where there's so many different examples out there that real creativity and standing out has become incredibly difficult. And products are now more commoditized than ever. And yeah. as a direct result of that, we're getting a lot of pages that look the exact same, a lot of value propositions that are basically cut and paste, and it's becoming extremely hard to stand out. So what's going to end up happening is you're going to have some brands that are able to like poke through and do things a little bit differently. And then you have other brands that are just seriously going to die because there's so much competition in the market for acquiring new customers and maintaining their interests and everything else that it's, it's going to be a slog. Like the next three years are going to see a lot of die off coming from brands, even brands that you know yeah. of that did really well, like the Caspers of the world that even made it public, but you know, had their valuation of 1 billion slash down to, I think the last I checked market cap was around 250 million. Like that's a 75% discount on a company that had a strong brand, but didn't have a strong business model in a highly commoditized market. So yes. if you think you're going to succeed, you better be thinking outside of the box and have like an exit strategy and build up, um, you know, good understanding of where your assets and where your valuable things lie. And, if anyone's read my post, it's owned audience all the way, like having a really good idea of who your your champions in your community are. Mm -hmm. And hiring goes to do the email to nurture that. Owned Absolutely. Audience. Thank you very much, Benjamin. I appreciate that. Um, let's, let's touch, John, on you said there's a lack of creativity. Why is that? And how can you become more creative if you have just been in the copy and paste crowd? I, I really, th you know, back in the day, we were talking on Clubhouse about this yesterday. Um, back in the day, we had stumble upon where you could just go through different websites and see what was out there and quickly flip through and your eye would catch something and you'd stop. And it was always something that looked a little different. Um, poolside FM 
was on product hunt earlier this year and they did like a retro mac desktop interface which was really cool and that's how you navigated their website and it really hit because it was something worth sharing i shared it on linkedin actually it, it got me like that uh I think that we've overcomplicated things and we've gone the way of everything needs to be super polished and, and really great. If you are a young brand right now, there are no rules. It's really, really hard to understand that. But if you're self-funded, there really are no rules. If you're just selling direct to consumer, there are no rules on what you like can and can't say in terms of using like the word fuck or anything else in your content. It doesn't matter. And everyone yeah. is so concerned about coming off as being polished and polish doesn't stand out. Polish blends in. Like you need to be the loud one in the room in order to create something just a little bit different. Yeah. Uh, I've seen a couple brands that have done this really well. Um, one of the, one of the things that I like is when people do buttons with big, you know, black drop shadows and stuff like that. So they stand out and they look a little bit different and you kind of can, you get that visual cue that they're trying to do something different. They're trying to pop people that have different color backgrounds, even if it's pastels. I was on a website the other day where if you click the background, it changed colors. So yeah. Subtle, but it, it gets you. And, it, and there is room to be really, really, really creative. You just need to break free of all the, I hate to say it, but like the agency best practices of, oh, this is your top piece. This is your other piece. This yeah. is whatever, like go a little crazy. Mm. So break free from those constraints, the, the best practices, which, as you said, will just cause you to blend in and be the same as everybody else. You want a sans serif type that's rounded? Cool. You're going to look really modern. I want to see someone use comic sans just because it's mm -hmm. ironic, right? Like, you don't want Hel Helvetica on there? Hmm, maybe you should try it. Like, you know, there's there's different ways to do things to stand out and there's different uses of existing things that could make things stand out. Like be bold with us with a CTA, make it something yeah. completely different. Like just try something different. Everything is the same at this point. Do you not? Yeah. I, I sort of agree with you. In fact, I largely agree with you. Do you not think conversely though, you can get to the point where you're just trying so much stupid shit just for the sake of standing out? Or do you think there's just such a, lack of originality that anything is better than nothing i i think there's so much lack of originality and i wouldn't have said this like five years ago but because everything has become so commoditized unless yeah. you stand out in the first 10 seconds on your page people are gone like it's such a high turnover at this point you've yeah. got your chance to get them and our coal there's there's a we'll get to this later but it's the company journey that's being pushed instead of the customer journey so often and that you're you've got 10 seconds to make an impression think about when you're scrolling through any feed the memes tend to get you because they're big bold letters that are geared to make you laugh on a recognizable image right there's a reason why they work it, it, they're 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 playing it up and they're drawing your attention to an awkward image met with you know some big bold text and the text is meant to make you laugh or have an emotional reaction. None of the texts that we write on any D2C website or e-commerce website really evokes the same reaction as a good, well-placed meme. Mm -hmm. So break the rules? Absolutely. Why, why would you try to compete with everyone else that's doing the same thing? Like if you are not, uh, in, the, in the words of a, of a lobbyist that, that I play golf with once, if you don't like the rules, change them change the law like yeah. that's that's it like there is there are no rules when you're young before you're in retail and before you're doing everything once you get to that point and you're omni channel then there's a little bit more rules you gotta abide by you know certain corporate things but before that you're just starting out make a name for yourself every yeah. single piece of content you push out you need to ask yourself if this was to go viral what would it do for my brand and how would it be reflected on my website and how can I create that viral loop with that? Absolutely. And like you said, because things are so commoditized, then you really need to differentiate yourself through content as well. Yeah. You're, most people, when they do their content, it's me, 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 sell, 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 my brand, yeah. my brand, my brand. Honestly, I don't really care about anyone's brand. I care about, do I like the product? Do I like what the product promises? And am I willing to give them a shot? 
have they de-risked that first purchase and answered all my questions well enough for me to say, you know what? Fuck it. Let's go with these guys. Let's give them a try. Yeah. Let's come on to that then, because we, in regards to content, um, you're very big on, and you've pointed out actually a couple of my examples on company journey versus customer journey. What, give us an overview of this concept, this topic, and where are people, where are companies going wrong at the moment in the way that they create all their marketing collateral and the way they push out content? Yeah, subscribe to an email list and see how many, the welcome series is great, but it always shows a picture of the product in it. Why? You came from the website, you signed up for the thing, you know what products they have, why are you pushing product on them? Like this is your time to build trust in the brand and the store. It's not building trust in the product. You already came and you signed up. It makes zero sense. Like that's that's just, I know the stats that say 22 to 28% of like sales come from the welcome series. But let's be real, like a lot of sites, even with like single products, we know why people signed up. They signed up because they care about the brand enough to keep it on their radar. It, it serves as like a virtual bookmark. Really, yeah. your goal is to build trust as a brand and de-risk their first purchase from you. That's it. And the idea that you're selling, I'm sorry, I don't believe in the whole like bundle stuff, discount stuff via emails and promotional stuff because you know what it does? It clogs up an inbox with a bunch of shit I don't care about. And you already got me. I already signed up. Like if you're trying yeah. to force me to force me to convert based on emails, you're really just playing the time game. You have to build enough trust up in the brand so that when it's my time to purchase something, I'm thinking about you as a brand. Yep. That's the customer journey, what we want. The company journey is what we end up with, which is too many emails, too many sales, too many campaigns, too much shit we don't care about. Uh, it could be a niche product in a specific sector. They could make a cooler, for instance, and it's just talking about their cooler, their cooler, their cooler, their accessories. And really it's about what you can do with a cooler, what you would do with a cooler. Like, tell me the great places I can, I can hike to if I'm visiting their hometown, where they're from. Build the brand in with the product. Figure yeah. out ways of kind of connecting those things. There's just so much opportunity, and I do think it's profound laziness. It, because we treat customers like they're transactions instead of people that we want to hang out with and possibly work with. If you treated customers like people you want to work with and bring into your company, you'd be hyping up like how cool of an environment it was, how cool the product works in that environment and everything else. You'd do a better job of selling to someone you were trying to onboard as an employee than you would a customer you're trying to transact with. But why don't we have the foresight? What creates that tension where companies get it wrong so much do you think it's a lack of data on the like the front end where does it where do we get it wrong where does that start off i think it started a long time ago where people thought that brands were brands and brands made companies and i think you have a lot of young companies that are comparing themselves to brands that have been around for a very very long time like if you look at uh mm -hmm. You know, if you're a new shoe upstart, you're going to look at, you know, reading Shoe Dog and how Nike started and everything else. But then you're going to jump to how Nike's currently advertising. Nike doesn't actually show their product in a lot of their ads. They don't have to. You, as a, as a young company, though, you really should take that approach. You don't necessarily need to show your product. You just need to tell a really good story around that. Um, that's more difficult, though, because it goes back to how everything's so commoditized now. What if that your story is you don't have one, you're just trying to make money? Sure, that's a different approach entirely. Godspeed, good luck to you. As the ad market changes, you know, you're gonna see some rising CAC and you gotta worry about your retention and your repeat customers on that front. Like, I don't know if that model is for the long term. I mean, I, I've heard stories about people moving different platforms like Pinterest and stuff like that, but you're mm -hmm. constantly chasing a new market, new audience, new yeah. marketing strategy in order to maximize your your profit margins per sale. So I, I think it can be done. I think that the best brands are the ones that, uh, I think the model of e-commerce is changing so much that we're gonna wind up with baseline products for a company and then special editions and limited drops to drive traffic back to the website for people that are diehard fans of the brand and be able to actually build stuff for the people like I can tell you right now, if anyone at Flylo is listening, you guys make great products, you have 
pretty bad color selection. And the fact that I only have three options for a jacket that I really like every single year and they're like, they just need to be better. Like I would buy three more jackets right now today if they had better oh, color selection. Yeah. And that's a, that's an issue, right? Like there's great products that should do really, really well, but are limited because they have to support other products in a line. And this yeah. has been true of every company. Your top 20% of your products are making the majority of your revenue for you. Let's figure out better ways to do it. We're at such this advanced stage in technology that we have the capability of kind of switching that up and doing better. But we don't. No. <laughs> Let's, um, you, you touched on something before that I know you, you've been quite outspoken about in terms of CAC, the cost overall. Yeah. So there is a, and a lot of people we work with as well. And I think, you know, Instagram, Facebook, Google are all very powerful and they have been, but you're seeing that margin really squeezed now, aren't you? So how can you shift away from that paradigm where you're so acquisition focused and you move towards a retention focused marketing? It's a, it's a huge dynamic shift and it goes against what most people are used to. The, the standard is run ad, collect email, convert it 2%, uh, you know, without the email, but try to grab as much data as possible, remarket them via flows and then hope for the best. And you know that like, if you do bare minimum with flows and email, you're going to convert it like eight to 10%. Like that's, it's pretty standard across the board. I think that, if you take that approach and you distill it down and you take a step back, you realize that good email flows will convert at eight to 10% of everyone that subscribes. So all of a sudden you can switch up your mentality of what your metrics mean. It's not about revenue. Maybe it's about owning that audience and nurturing that audience. Maybe it's not about offers and deals. Maybe it's about bringing them into a community as a brand and letting your automated flows take care of the actual conversion. So instead of running campaigns that are around sales and deals and trying to get people to purchase, you can make campaigns around stuff that's relevant to your industry that people are into. Mm -hmm. It's that dynamic shift that provides value that isn't tied to having to transact all the time. Yeah. Uh, and I suppose you might be in trouble if you don't know how to provide value in um, your specific industry, but how would you go along, go about finding out what your customers care about and, what so, they actually, and creating content to nurture them based on that. I love this because this topic came up and I guarantee you right now, like if you go to your blogs or whatever you got, this works for SaaS and it works for everything else. Um, your top blog post is probably tangentially related to your product or your environment, but it's not necessarily related directly to your product. I mm -hmm. like, I know, I know for LifeX, the top, uh, the top article was what's the difference between an E26 and E27 bolt. And that's just the difference of, you know, a millimeter difference from us and North America versus uh, Europe in terms of the, the configure the, whatever the socket part. Right. Um, yeah. that was the top rated article. It, it had very, it had nothing to do with color changing Wi-Fi connection or anything else or app control or smart lighting or, you know, working with Google or anything else. It, that was the article that did and drove a lot of the traffic. And yeah. this is true across SaaS companies too. They always have an article about something weird that they do. Uh, a previous SaaS company I worked with, it was about finding, finding like the, the, the sender ID within like an email and the meta code or some, some shit like that. And that was the top article that we had on that blog. This yeah. is always the way it works out. We try yeah. so hard to say, oh, our people want to hear about this, 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 and this. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Yeah. <laughs> Classic example of that actually is um, bodybuilding.com, who basically created a supplement company out of tons and tons of great quality content. And I feel as though that's where maybe they, they've not lost the way when they've stopped focusing on that community. Um, and got involved in that race to the bottom with Amazon. And when they were so focused on just answering how to get the biggest biceps, like the best fat loss programs, and that was their sole focus, they sold a huge amount of supplements just as a byproduct of that trust. If you're starting an e-commerce company today, be a media company first. I yeah. keep saying this. You have to approach everything as your media company that happens to sell product. 
not a product company that happens to also do media. It's the backwards way of looking at it. Today, we are so content heavy. And uh, Reddit's, uh, sorry, Red Bull is a great example of this. Red Bull has its own media division. Mm -hmm. A lot of the big guys spend a ton of money on their own media divisions to keep stuff up. Now, if you're a small brand, that's really tough to do, but we've seen great examples from like Chris Mead that has people on uh, and CrossNet that have people on retainer just to make content for them. I think that is the smartest move in the world right now. Like making yourself, treating yourself as like a media agency is gonna pay dividends in the long run. Uh, it, it just is. Very interesting. Yeah, that's a lot of food for thoughts for myself, actually, because like you said, it's not just e-commerce, it's applicable to all industries. And if I look at, not to say, you know, I'm a seven, eight figure e-commerce company, but the way we built our brands was just answering questions about email and providing education around it. And then people just inquire naturally about services from that. It's it's amazing. It's That's the value that people are looking for. And I wrote this article on LinkedIn, which got me banned on Reddit was create a newsletter yes. instead of creating an e-commerce brand. Understand your customer before you decide yeah. to like jump into it. If you have a newsletter and you can spot like products that you're thinking about producing, you can track all your clicks via the emails and find out what people are clicking on. Yeah. You work your way to an affiliate deal, even just a little bit to track a coupon code on stuff, you know what people are actually purchasing. So if you decide to compete with them, you, 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 you have a jump start. You already know who your clients and your customers are and what they're interested in. Uh, and the problem that I see right now in e-com, like we've been saying, is it's so commoditized that it would do really, really well. And we're starting to see this, like D2C curation websites that are starting to show off different companies in the D2C space, et cetera. It's never a creation, it's a distribution problem. And it's always going to be a distribution problem. Me to create something from China is 30 to 60 days. I could have everything from start to finish. With people that I know that are already connected, I could probably do it in less than 30 days, to be completely honest. And then it's just a marketing problem. So we're back to square one, which is how do we sell this stuff? How do we distribute yeah. this stuff? And everyone is always saying, oh, how do I get more users? And how do I do this? And how do I do that? And People buy a bunch of stuff, and very rarely do we actually talk to customers past purchase, other than customer support. Yeah. That is that is very interesting, and I know I not necessarily challenged you on it, but I, I pushed you a little bit on how to do that, and it did make me think because you're mitigating the need to have that upfront investments as well in inventory and and things that you're just guessing will actually work and having to iterate on it. You can just. <laughs> And you're going to have to build the audience anyway and nurture them with content. So you might as well start with that, have a low risk investment. And then, yeah, I mean, you can create something people actually want rather than guessing what they do. There are so many great materials out there, technologies that aren't, that are waiting to be combined and to make cool shit with. Like there are so many things that we can go through and think of that just need some degree of a solution for. I know I've come across stuff where I love a material, but the cut of something is just terrible. Yeah. And, and that happens all the time. And I know when I find good stuff and that it's that that it's hard to find, or there's good stuff that's only made by a couple uh, bigger manufacturers. I love niches though. I don't think that like, I'm not saying go out there and make t-shirts and hoodies and everything else like everyone else. That's pure yeah. brand that gets that stuff sold. But in different niche communities, if you're building stuff for or better materials for runners or, or weightlifters or, you know, people that play soccer and you're picking like a niche where people can relate to the need for something that's a little bit better, you're going to do really, really, really well. Like, I want to correct you on a couple of things, though. Yeah. Number one, it's football, not soccer. Uh, yeah. Two, we say niche, not niche in England. <laughs> <laughs> let's the talk more co-marketing uh we've, we've touched a little bit about it before you mentioned uh chris at crossfit so yeah big opportunity this year underutilized what's your thoughts how you should how should you approach this uh this is the this is the lovely bit i can tell you some stuff that we've done in the past that's really worked that people don't do this is my my nugget of gold for this thing um 
cross marketing it, it can work really really well there's a couple spaces that i think that are underutilized one is on a receipt when you send out a receipt a lot of people use it to upsell people are just on your website stop upselling pick something that you don't make find a company that's like you that's in the same space same lifestyle space if you make clothes and you don't make bags find a bag maker and put a discount on the bottom of your receipt and swap with them they obviously don't make clothes they don't compete with you have them put a coupon code on the bottom of their receipt. It's got a hundred percent open rate for checking to order and everything else. And you've got like free advertising for people that have already committed to buying something in your net, uh, your niche. There you go. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> something in your niche. And it's, it's, it's really easy to find complimentary products that just make sense around similar sized companies that are, that are getting going and no one does it. And we've run tests on this and we've watched, during high high sales times when we've run it we've made we've made other companies like six figures in a couple of days and it's free really reciprocal and it builds like you said you can tap into each other's audiences and not necessarily compete but help each other out i mean honestly if i was running a brand right now i would put that as part of like the big strategy of finding six partners and rotate every month with a different partner so that you're kind of building each other's lists up on the super cheap and lowering your cost per acquisition massively love it so would you recommend uh post purchase like the auto confirmation um first email really go in with that yeah. anywhere else like in the flows I would do it. I would do it everything post purchase and I would hit it on the ones that are most high, highly open. So for most of you, it's going to be order confirmation. And then um, when it ships, that's another one that people tend to open a lot because they want to know when it's going to get there. Um, you're going to get really high open rates on that and it's dead space. <laughs> and I, I hate to say yeah. it, but it's like dead space. And it's not the time. I know that there's people that want to go for the immediate, like, let's raise the, the average order value on this card or whatever. But if someone's already purchased, there's nothing stopping them from going back and purchasing again and just starting another order and then you combining them. Like, there's there really isn't anything there. So as much as people like to debate on, like, oh, it's great for upselling right away and everything else, I think that's a bad customer experience. I don't want you to show me stuff that I should have been adding the first time around. You can nurture me after I get my stuff and I test out the quality. But if it's my first order, don't start selling me more stuff. It's odds are I'm buying a very minimal amount just so I can test out your brand. Yep. Fair comments. I mean, you it's a mentality shift, isn't it? It goes back to what you were saying before. You're really holistically focused on the lifetime value and what gives you the chance in the future to extract more. I shouldn't say extract more value, but you people are buying from you as a byproduct of trust and because they like you rather than brute force buy this it's 20 percent off yeah if we're actually running a, a test on something similar to this right now and uh it was someone someone i'm close with actually went through through a process that we were testing non-prompted non-prompted but went through the process and the results are kind of staggering because everything that we assume by making a couple of changes here and there kind of bled out into what the customer experience was like for him. Uh, he made certain decisions. I'm sorry, I'm being vague here, but he made certain decisions based on what was available to him that nurtured him into being a more of a lifetime customer immediately, just because of the options that we presented to him as a customer. Um, and that was a big takeaway is, there was no that we'd remove the pressure to transact all at once and by instead focusing on starting lifetime value from the from the get-go it made the buying experience have less friction for him which allowed him to like fully be committed to making the first purchase decision instead of waffling on it yeah very interesting i want to talk to you about this actually after we uh, finish this live i'd love to to if you're able to share a couple of examples yeah uh, actually let, let's deal with this question first because we, we touched on a a little bit around it so it seems like one of your philosophies and i, I agree with this if so is to sell more in e-commerce sell less in your overall messaging yeah uh, i think that 
I think that everyone needs to understand that the customer journey for most companies and brands that are new is, and I talked about this actually yesterday, you got to assume that everyone coming to your website is a brand new first time customer because that's who you're designing your website for. Um, and it's okay if it seems really rudimentary and you've got repeat customers and they know what they're looking for. It's fine. You look at Hotjar and they click on the products right away and they go to where they want to. You're not offending them. You, yeah. really, you really do need to spend time though on not pushing a deal, not pushing a sale, but bringing someone down a track of understanding what most people like about the products that you're selling and how to present that. So, I mean, I think really what we're looking for is category discovery, right? You hit a web page or home page, and then you're looking to figure out, you know, how to route someone into the categories and stuff that they're looking for. And then you're looking to tell a story about those categories and, and what to look out for. Um, and a lot of brands don't do this. And it really kind of annoys me um, because a uh, good example, I was looking for, I was looking for running shoes for trail running that were Gore-Tex. Right, because I want to use them for golf because it's wet right now, and I also don't really like golf shoes because they're not all that comfortable. Um, and I, it's hard to break that down on a website to go find that. You have to do a search, then you have to get in there, and you have to do this and that. And if I could just like work my way through more helpfully by being like, oh, running shoes, oh, requirements, oh, trail running, oh, requirements, waterproof, not waterproof. Okay, now I know where I'm at. That's how I personally shop. And yep. we've been playing around with this a little bit, but have you ever clicked on a product and you like the color and then you click on it and then you look at your size and it's sold out? Yep. Yeah, it's a shitty experience, isn't it? You're yep. like, well, I only wanted this one. And then you have to put in your email to get a notification if it comes back into stock and you don't know how often they restock because they don't tell you that. And it's just like a terrible, miserable experience. And then you leave their site to go find it somewhere else, maybe at another retailer or Amazon. And blah, 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 blah. That's such a broken customer journey and it doesn't even need to be that way. All you need to do is just help tell me where things are at. If a company, this actually happened to me the other day. I was on a website and I'm gonna bust them out right here. I like them as a company. I really like their emails. They do great stuff. Bad Birdie, uh, it's a golf company and they were going through supply issues because of COVID and stuff was uh, sitting at the ports, etc. None of that was mentioned on their website. And I found a shirt that I wanted, but it wasn't in my size. And they yep. didn't mention on that website where else their product was sold and where it was in stock. So they were collecting email for that reason, but I'd already signed up for their subscription list, so it didn't really matter. And then they did let me know when things came back into stock, but this was before the holidays. Push that revenue to a retailer, make the retailer look really good. And it's not about selling as much as it is, you know, directing people and answering their question. Like it's, you know, I know that they wanted the sale on their website because of margins and everything else, but that was a great opportunity as a brand to instead say, we're out of stock. This is what's going on. Transparency, by the way, we're also sold out these particular retailers. They might have us in stock. Yeah. That was the experience I was looking for. And I'm sorry, guys, I'm chastising you a little bit, but shit, you would have had like a great relationship with that retailer before the holidays. Everyone would have been happy. Your customers would have still bought from you direct and it would have been a great, you know, situation. But that's, that's the problem of what we're doing, which is transact, transact, transact. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's scary. It, it's scary that some of those things exist. Like pandemic hit, there was no like uh, brick and mortar retail, right? There still really isn't. Why does everyone have free shipping limits? Everyone should just do free shipping. Adjust to, you know, what it would be like if I could walk into a store. Yeah. And I felt safe walking into a store. Like that doesn't make sense to me. Why well, still have the limits of $50 for free shipping or whatever and not provide other options? It's like you're just gouging people instead of like, selling less like you're saying and then building up rapport to sell more later mm -hmm. so obviously the, the fundamentals of trust and just having solid principles of trying to help people and then by good faith you're assuming that you'll get the maximum lifetime value rather than launching things in people's face all the time and just assuming that that's going to move the needle i mean i don't even think it's good faith I mean, like talk about an experience that you want to, you're, you're looking for experience that you want to replicate, right? And yeah. we all, 
this is the thing I was saying earlier about websites. They're all the same. They all look the same. They all do the same stuff. And this is part of the problem. Like it's all, it's all the same. Like there are so many different ways to go out. I mean, we include some GIFs, uh, that are fun in some of our emails directly from the founder or when people buy stuff. So they go, Hey, is that actually the person? Yeah. And then actually I might add this today, like actually found or pictured like in, you know, brackets or something like that. Like there are yeah. ways to be cute about trying to connect with people. We're just really, really lame at doing it. Yeah. <laughs> and we don't need to be lame at doing it. Like yeah. the, the about us page is one of the top click pages on any e-commerce site. And yet that's the only place that you really see the founders other than like the welcome first email. That's it. Yeah. Like there are better ways to do this. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it's a, it's a mentality shift, isn't it? I think we're trying to, um, on a personal level, deliver more experiences to the inbox. So not just trying to sell, but try to make people genuinely want to open the emails and be excited about them and I, so how do you how do you do that though like you do that by lessening the amount of emails that you send mm -hmm. and making them really really good that are focused on nothing that's sales related mm -hmm. yeah it's, it's hard because i think from a performance marketing standpoint as well not many e-commerce owners understand that and it's the same for ads and everything else you get brought in and it's what's the ROI, what's the, the ROAS and it, people, unless people have the foresight to play the long game, then they're always going to be attached to those short term metrics. It, they're, they're not linked brand and agency metrics are not linked. Brands expect immediate results. Agencies want to build relationships with customers mm -hmm. and they're just not linked as a brand. If you have time to do that, you should always spend the time to like build something long term. And you should go into every communication you have with the notion that I'm not about selling a product. I'm about bringing someone into a community where I can sell a product to them forever. That, yeah. That's the kind of experience that you need. LL Bean is a great example of a company that's crushed it with their lifetime warranty on their stuff. They have people for life that come in and there's whole subreddits, you know, geared up towards, you know, buy it for life. And they just rep products that they believe are super high quality that are going to last a lifetime. And they always stand by their products. One of the things that really bothers me about a lot of companies right now is it's uh, they get into the place of not hyping the warranty or not giving a real good guarantee. And, uh, you know, shout out to a couple of brands that like do like a really, really good job of standing by their product. The, the, the cost of not standing by your product and giving someone a hard time yep. spreads 10 X someone having a good experience with your product. If someone has a good experience with your product. They're going to tell like two or three people. If they have a bad experience. 10 people are going to hear about it. Yeah. If you lose out on 10 people that have potential lifetime of, you know, 200 bucks a pop, a hundred bucks a pop. That's a that's tons of money. That's just hemorrhaging. For yeah. no particular reason, you're losing a thousand, two thousand dollars just on one experience that might have cost you like literally making it right. Yeah. 40 bucks, maybe. For, I'll trade 40 bucks for a thousand, two thousand dollars in profit down the road every single day. I'm sorry. That's like, that's great ROI for me. So all these brands that that go into the, the notion of we got to be really strict about this, 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 and this, it's small pictures, small revenue games. And do it too much, you can get in trouble. I get that, but that means you've picked a bad product that doesn't have a high enough margin in the first place. And yeah. if you're doing anything e-com right now, you need to make sure that your margins are high enough to allow you to play out all these different scenarios. And you should write down all these scenarios. And a lot of people don't do this. And a lot of people don't actually look at the, the real ROAs and the, the real ROI on stuff. But you gotta factor everything in and in, overestimate what your what your 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 multiple is on that product and then start peeling back with what you can concede what you could potentially concede and then your absolute max that you can concede good stuff really interesting thoughts let's let's talk a bit about what brands then excite you because we've talked about some of the shit things people are doing but who's doing a good job what anyone you want to give credit to in particular I'm going to say the best, best emails I've come across lately have been bad birdies because they're, 
Yeah. Gold. Yeah. Because they're not selling and they, the email is about their blog and it's about what's going on in, in golf in general. And as someone that's a golfer and, and plays a lot, I really actually respect that they don't sell in the, yeah. and it keeps me engaged with uh, what they have. And they do put out emails once in a while when things are, are back in stock and they're ready to go, which is what I want to hear. And that's fine. New styles. That's cool. But uh, they've done a really, really good job of, like I, even if I didn't buy any product, I still enjoy the newsletter and still are getting in front of me on a regular basis. So that's that's pretty cool. Um, the guys at Huckberry are always one of my favorites because they really do a lot of story about the brand and backstory. And they've never made it about getting a deal on a product, but being introduced to a, a line of products that they believe is high quality. And I think that's a, that's a really smart methodology to it. And they've done some of the best content I've seen of any e-commerce brands. Um, there's a lot of really bad offenders out there too that just send tons of stuff all the time. Sale, 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 and it just never ends. Uh, yeah. And unfortunately, that's the majority of them. I think I've subscribed to at least 50 different emails of brands that I kind of care about and want to look yeah. at, but I dump them in another inbox just so that I don't have to see them all the time because it's a lot. Have you ever heard of um, Death Wish Coffee? Yeah, I did not subscribe though. I've, yeah, I'm not as well, but I've seen them mentioned quite a few times. They just push the uh, podcast and news uh, blogs, there, which they have like a really strong cult following. So I think that's that's yeah. the way forward, right? That's yeah. that's you're providing value to people that care about like a, a sector. Um, I mean. A, this has been a topic like weekly on Clubhouse, especially with uh, the guys over at Hush, where they they talk about like the need to integrate content for their audience because there's only so much you can talk about sleep, and it's not what sleep yeah. does, but it's what sleep enables. And this is the big thing that I think a lot of people forget: you don't buy a product for what it does; you buy a product for what it allows you to do. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't buy a jacket because it. it covers me and keeps me warm i buy a jacket so that i can go do shit when it's cold outside like the focus is wrong but what about emotional purchases say for example a rolex compared to a swatch yeah I, that's this is a, a theory that i have of want need and desire um people that need something will buy whatever checks the box and makes it work and it's going to do it. People that want something are people that will move that need into a want. There might be three jackets or three watches and you, you need, you want that particular watch. Yeah. Rolex for me would be fall into more of a desire. And if financial circumstances allowed that desire can then move to a want. Uh, I do think people are aspirational, but it's really annoying driving a supercar around all the time. Like it, mm -hmm. it's just not practical. So the sweet spot for most brands is actually moving everything into like that want category. And that's the emotional part, which is moving something that is a need into something that they, they that's a little bit better or a little bit different. And that becomes a want. The desire is something that you can sell into and great. If you can hit it, that's spectacular, but there isn't as large of an audience for Rolexes as there are for swatches. Mm -hmm. I'd much rather find a brand that isn't the super highest end, isn't the super lowest end, but builds good brand reputation about being right in the middle. It's like the Nike versus Gucci shoes or some shit like that, right? Like mm -hmm. you get Payless and you got your knockoff brands that you get on Amazon and then you got your Allbirds and then you got your, your, you know, your Gucci loafers, right? Like there's different things for different people, but at a certain point it becomes a status symbol that goes beyond a need and a want. It becomes something that kind of takes on a different meaning. Do you have a set of Gucci loafers, by the way? Absolutely not. Rolex? Nope. I don't wear a watch. <laughs> I still have an iPhone 6S. Wow. Interesting. Email v SMS. Um, let's go back to a little bit about you made a prediction then on how channels are going to change. And you talked a little about limited drops on each one and owned audience, obviously. How would you all right we, we know what people are doing wrong already you've talked a lot about <laughs> it so <clears throat> how let's differentiate a little bit between email and sms and how would you approach both because obviously there is a cost consideration for sms much more so than email and that's going to put a lot of downward pressure on um 
a brand to say, like, how do we deliver the maximum value of an SMS given how much, how costly it is? Or is that just the wrong way to look at it altogether? It is entirely the wrong way to look at it. And here's why. In the next year, it's not going to matter. There's so many no-code platforms and you can use Twilio and make everything happen on your own. And people I've talked to that are heavy into SMS are building their own platforms and systems at like a tenth of the cost. So the cost that exists right now is going to go down. Um, and it's gonna go down pretty rapidly. I think that right now it's kind of the new thing for people and it also depends on the demographic. And I've heard this from multiple different people I've been talking to. Some people say it's like the Gen Z that never checks email, so SMS is the best way to get a hold of them in social media. Totally buy into that. I'm not Gen Z, you know, but like I get that. I could get how that happens. The other thing I've heard is the flip side is much older people over the age of 50 are opting in via SMS too, because that seems to be they're not on computers all day long. Or mm -hmm. you, you think about people that mobile is their first, so SMS seems to be like a better mm -hmm. fit for them. Um, I don't think that the the channel matters as much as how you treat the channel matters. And by that, I mean, we abuse email like massively, like brands are really, really bad at just sending tons of emails and just hoping and praying for the best. And that's really a bad experience. And I think SMS is more targeted where people are typically more engaged because uh, it's a little bit more to give over a phone number and your signup rates are going to be typically less via SMS, but they are more engaged. So you have a direct channel with someone's device that they have on them all the time with great power comes great responsibility. Um, yeah. And I think that we're going to see more personally as a consumer, I'll give my email away. Asking SMS is too much. If you want me to use SMS to get shipping updates and stuff like that, I'm cool. Uh, if you want me to double opt in to a special list for special limited edition drops, SMS might be something that I'm into. Um, Nike moved and built their own app for this. Like as much as people hate the sneakers app, like they found that there was enough demand for that particular thing just to build an app. And you've got new tools like uh, Flutter and languages where you can build for iOS and Android. And you've got tools out there where you can drag and drop and build your own mobile app. We're not that far away in the no code space from people that are really dedicated to a brand to just be able to download an app or create something in HTML5 and save it as a shortcut on their phone. Like this is, this is where the tech plays into where we're headed. And I think SMS is a bridge, but shit, if you have a big enough list on your SMS, you really got to start thinking about how do I hit people with push notifications via an app, which are going to do the same as an SMS and keep someone's inbox clear. And you're going to get more respect from the person for doing that. You know, you challenge a lot of conventional beliefs and it's hard to catch you out with anything. Not that I'm trying to. <laughs> it seems you you must think a lot of the traditional metrics maybe are bullshit and that they're not going to matter in the long term. I do. I think that the way that we've been tracking stuff is inaccurate. I think that we've been tracking stuff based on a company journey, uh, which is really, really scary. Uh, because as the more we focus on a company journey, all the metrics make sense for the company journey. You yeah. Know, your open rate makes sense. Your uh, click through rate makes sense. Your revenue makes sense. But all that's company journey. That's not the customer journey at all. Visitors to your site, that's company journey. I don't care if 10 people visit my site versus 100 people visit my site. If 10 people buy from both groups, I care more about the 10 people that visited than purchased. They had a better experience. I want to know why. I think this is the fallacy that we have, which we think that, uh, and this is social media metrics, great metrics to, to kind of dig down deep into. They're completely vanity. The mm -hmm. amount of interaction that you have is great, but if your quality of content isn't there, then there's nothing that's going to help that from happening. Just because you have a million followers on Instagram doesn't mean that everyone's a purchaser. Some people just follow just for the sake of following. So can you bring them over the line? I don't know. At least they're aware of you. That's like one stage. But if you're a brand and you're followed by a bunch of people that are 10 years old that don't have zero spending capital and it's a bunch of like sports cars, you're not really selling to them. You're just that they're fake. They don't make sense. So I do think a lot of the metrics that we measure towards are really bad. 
uh, quality of traffic is like my big pet peeve. Yeah. Huge pet peeve on quality of traffic because the way we measure it is time on site, bounce rate, how many pages clicked, you know, what they look at, you know, hot jar, did they click this button? Uh, and I've given this example multiple times over. You could have a, a website that's completely white with just big red circles and then you could with a dotted line. And if you did it right, your time on site's gonna go up, your bounce rate's gonna go down as long as you have something entertaining where you hover over it and maybe it says some words and you know exactly where people are gonna be moving with their eyes and their cursor in order to hover over and see something. You've now yeah. gamed the entire system that we rely on currently in order to determine quality of traffic. It makes zero sense. So that, that goes back to the first thing we talked about, didn't it, with, um being different and how a lot of the conventional wisdom is just bullshit the rules <laughs> it is it is absolutely bullshit like we've we're our attention spans are less than like eight seconds and i think we're less than a goldfish at last count like this is why youtube ads are five seconds and then you skip and then the only yeah. youtube ads i don't end up skipping <clears throat> happen to be movie trailers because movie trailers have figured out that they need to get you in the first five seconds otherwise you're not watching it and it's really interesting if you spend, I would say every marketer should spend at least 10 hours on YouTube a week just to see the ads and how they're put together pre-roll because you realize the attention span is really, really small. And there's only a couple people that are able to really knock it out of the park with those things. And YouTube videos in general, like the ideal length for a YouTube video is 10 minutes. That's where they can get multiple ad sets in there and everything else. And the, the viewing time helps their algorithm for getting them promoted. Watch some of those uh, videos and see how they tackle it with uh, the first like 10 seconds of the video because they all do the same thing and they follow the same format and it works really, really well like really, really well. If you watch any of Mr. Beast's videos, it's a marketing class in and of itself. He <laughs> has it down to a science. He knows exactly how to present, exactly how long to present, exactly how long the video should be, the inflection points within the videos. He has it all, there's so much data going on behind the scenes and people don't even realize that. And this is the problem that most e-commerce people take is they jump in and then they don't pay attention to the data and they don't have a formula to follow in order to figure out if something's working or not working. So if most of the conventional wisdom is bullshit, is there anything that you would recommend paying more attention to? Obviously lifetime value is an important one, but any, I know Valentin talks about the, the CAC and lifetime value ratio. Like, how would you gauge success and that you're moving in the right direction over the long term? I think you run a bunch of experiments that are based on removing current biases that exist in the system. And this is how I always view things. I look at what the current biases are in a system and I look to erase those variables and instead change the methodology by which we reset a baseline. Um, a lot of companies get into a habit of uh, running sales around holidays and promotions like that, but they don't know if they didn't run sales, if their sales would actually change. A lot of people spend a lot of money on advertising and they drive traffic or they drive subscribers or whatever, yet it, they, the, the net is, and you can, talk, so you can speak to this, the net of like your open email rates doesn't really change that much whether or not you're running a shit ton of ads or you're not running a shit ton of ads and you're acquiring a bunch of people, pretty much the open rate for that first email is always gonna hover between 30 and you know 50%. Like it doesn't change. You would think that it would change based on the stuff that you're doing, but it actually doesn't change. So if, if you can't remove all those biases and then realize that maybe we're tracking the wrong things, you're in for a lot of trouble. Like you're, you're honestly in for a lot of trouble. And I do see a shifting mentality to spending time on things that don't scale and yeah. testing things that are really, really radically different. There are so many cool stuff that people can try these days. And there's a lot of really neat tools that are being underutilized that people could like really get in there and try some crazy experiments. I mean, some of those clients that, that I'm working with, we already know like behavior and stuff like that. We're working on figuring out ways that we can target individual people and A, B, C, D, E, F, 
G tests individual offers to those specific people. Like there's nothing stopping you from noticing that someone's been on the site three times, but it's never purchased and sending them an email that says, Hey, here's a coupon code for 80% off. You're obviously interested, but you have reservations. Let's see if this works. Right. Mm -hmm. Does anyone ever ask you to do that? Nope. No, why not? It's, it's super easy. They're engaged. You might as well figure out if you're willing to convert them. You're just looking at your retention rate, right? Your lifetime value on that customer. If you, if you have a retention rate of over 25%, you're doing better than most people. But if you have a retention rate of 50%, giving an 80% discount that breaks you even on that purchase with the likelihood they're going to come back isn't actually bad math. You're just flipping a coin to see if you can bring someone into the ecosystem, your product does well enough, and then they'll buy more from you. This is the problem I have with e-commerce. I had a problem with e-commerce because it's a one size fits all for every single audience member without any real look at what the data is and very little experimentation when it comes to understanding buyer psychology and, and moving the needle. Yeah. I'm looking forward to the John of Anko e-commerce framework and you should make a course and sell it for $997. I did unicornhunter.com. That's, that's what's happening. Uh, like, honestly, I am geared up to change the mentality of businesses. I mean, I think there's a lot of young companies that I talk to that are all struggling with the same stuff. And it's not just young companies. I talk to established companies that are doing pretty well, and it's still the same gaps. So I think there is... There Everyone's are, guessing. It is. This is, <laughs> this is what it comes down to. Like, if, if someone tells me they're not guessing, I, I'm calling absolute bullshit. Because if, unless you can point to data that shows stuff clearly, and don't get me started on this, there's a lot of really great platforms out there, like Dynamic Yield is spectacular. Good luck in the UK. Good luck on a Brave browser. Like these tools don't exist outside of the US for a reason, and the US privacy laws are gonna start slapping down all this uh, third party tracking across multiple websites. Like we're headed for this huge change in game that I don't think anyone's really anticipating. And iOS 14 that everyone's like, oh, it might be something, it might not be something. iOS 14 is a smoke screen. Like CCPA that's changing the CPRA in a couple of years and getting more strict, that's the domino effect. It's going to start in California. That's going to start rolling out everywhere else. And then people are going to realize they have other options. And then all of a sudden you're going to wind up in a situation where Everyone's going to be caught flat-footed and still not knowing the quality of their traffic. John, I'm going to have to cut it short. It's been a pleasure. I'm excited to see what's next from you in the future. How can people uh, contact you? Obviously, I know you can. Um, I'll tag you in LinkedIn on this, and if anyone's got any comments, they can just drop them below. I'm sure you get back to them. Yeah, LinkedIn is great. Um, and that's the best way to get in touch with me and chat me up. And then usually I, I have, I can supply a link where someone can find me and schedule something on Calendly. I usually block out Fridays for just taking fun calls with people to see what people are up to and stuff like that. Good stuff, mate. I really appreciate your time. Lots of great insights and I will speak to you soon. I'm gonna end it here. Thanks much, Adam. You're welcome.